All right, everybody, it's finally here. This is the one you've been waiting to hear me cover. This is cars versus freight. This is my stint hauling freight, switching to cars, hauling cars full blown for over, uh, it'd be almost four months now. So let's break this down into four main areas. We're gonna go over cost, availability, flexibility, and practicality. Let's jump into it. All right, everybody, so on cost, let's jump right into this. On cost, upfront cost, insurance, the big hitter everybody's worried about. They think that cars cost way more than freight does. It'll double your policy. Not true at all. For initial startup cost, let's, let's wipe everything clean and say you're starting up. The minimums you have to have to haul freight, 750,000. That's it. Uh, that's to register FMCSA to get your own authority. The minimums you need to haul to pull on a load board for most carriers, most brokers, you want to have go ahead and have a million dollar freight policy and you want to go ahead and have about $100,000 cargo. Now that'll change depending on what all you set up with, but Initially, to start out to cover all your bases, that's pretty much the go-to, uh, 1100000 k Now, for cars, it's a lot different. Uh, just to start out to get your authority as a car hauler, it's going to have to start out as a $1 million policy. Now, to, to jump on to Central Dispatch to get on with all these other brokers that everybody starts doing, a lot of them require you to actually have an extra $1 million policy on your, or extra $1 million worth of coverage on your policy. So, that'll take you up to $2 million total covered, $1 million aggregate, and for a three car hauler like I have with your twos to threes, they typically want 100,000. I went ahead and up that to 150 so I don't have to worry about anything. There's a few brokerages and um, shippers that do require you have 150,000 for a three car setup. So that's what I got. My policy when I first started just as a freight hauler, uh, no autos even on my policy. This was just general freight. Uh, was right at 9K. It was like 89 something, 89 and change, 8,900 and change. So... That's going to start off right at 9K. Now, two months into my policy, I actually switched that when I started adding vehicles to my policy. That bumped it up about $350 a year. So we're at about $93.50 a year. And now this is me, but we're at right around $93.50 a year uh, to haul general freight and autos. To switch to car hauler, that was going to bump my policy $3,600 a year. That's all. So I went from about $9,000 right up to about 12.6. So it's not really that big of an increase. Everybody thinks it's gonna double that. I'm still well within that range that everybody considers normal. Um, it's just, it's really gonna depend on you, your state, all that, but hauling cars instead of freight, it's really not that different. Uh, as far as the upfront cost for insurance, it'll be, it'll, it will be more expensive for autos, flat out. But it's not crazy. It's not like do or die on that. It's pretty close. So the trailers in this comparison are pretty much a wash. I mean, if you get a bare bones uh, flatbed, it's going to cost about as much as a bare bones, you know, two car hauler or um, even just a just your standard three car wedge. Um, once you start upping all that, you can up it on each side. And I mean, you know, you start jumping into four or five car haulers, you know, with hydraulics and uh, you start jumping into the flatbed trailers with hydraulics and dovetails and you know all that stuff they can pretty much run about dead even on price so it doesn't really cost more to run one or the other uh as far as your trailer goes on equipment though equipment is a big difference because it is going to cost you a lot more to buy all the equipment you need to haul any kind of freight now if you're jumping into something specific that's going to be nice because you've only got to buy what you need for that but if you want the diversity of hauling freight, uh, you're going to have to buy everything. You're going to need chains, binders, straps, tarps, everything that goes with that, bungees. Uh, to whereas with the car hauler, that you know you're only going to need some straps, and uh, you know depending on how far into it you go, you might have to buy a winch up front. But you know that's generally a one-time purchase if you take care of it. But that's going above and beyond. You know if you're just going to haul stuff that moves on its own power. You're not going to need all that. You're really just going to need enough straps to cover it and enough straps is a little bit of backup. That's it. Let's jump into availability now. As far as availability goes, it may look like freight has it, you know, right away up front. And wh why that is, is that if you were to go on, let's say truck stop, pull up a general, you know, search radius around where you are and look how many flatbed loads, because if you're searching right, you're searching hotshot, you're searching flatbed, you're searching step deck, you're even searching RGN. I used to. And, uh, and then you're, you're having to weed through all that. Now, once you do weed through all that, you're going to kind of find a, a much smaller parameter of what you actually can haul. Now let's divvy that down even more to, does it match your weight? Does it match your length? And does it match uh, the cost that you're going to need to run that? 
And so that, that dials it down even more and you're left with a few loads that you can actually take. Now that's just out of the gate scenario. Let's say you've already got your staple load on and you're looking for parcels to gather along the way. That aperture on that goes down way, way more because now you've got to find something that's only going to fit on the room that you've got. And you know, with the, what, whatever weight you've got left, it's got to be going the way that you're actually going. Plus it has to match your time frame. So now once you put all those filters on there, it's hard to find loads. So it may look like, you know, you've got all this to choose from at first, but when you really die down to what you actually can choose, you know, it makes a big difference. And now cars, you know, I mean, they're readily available across the country. It doesn't matter really where you are. There's always cars in the hall. Is there the volume there that you would want? Probably not, but you can pretty much, you know, you can go a lot of places that you wouldn't want to go on a freight trailer because that's basically considered a dead zone. You know, cars don't really have those. Uh, there's, there's dead zones on prices too, to where it looks like to me from what I've seen, you know, the, the cars are pretty consistent. You also find that on freight, uh, freight's very temperamental because it, it changes week to week. It actually really changes day to day. So it's it, it can be very spotty and it can be extremely seasonal as well. To whereas cars, it's, from what I've seen, it's pretty much a straight line across the board. There's not really many highs. There's not really many lows like there are in freight. Not to say that one is better than the other on that, but if you don't have a ton of business coming out or going into where you live, uh, you're going to have to move around quite a bit hauling freight uh, to where, as I found with cars, it's a lot easier to stay uh, pretty compact and, and basically build your customer base really close to where you can overlap. Uh, you can find loads to and from the house real easy. It's It's been great for me. But the other things I like about that is kind of brings us into the next part, which is flexibility. Flexibility is a huge benefit with cars. Most freight is pretty much going to work like this. It's going to be first come, first serve or you're gonna be on appointment. And on average, most shippers and receivers are on bank hours. You're gonna be working, you know, pretty much the seven to 8 a.m. window until about the three to 4 p.m. window. And that's it, Monday through Friday, there's rarely any weekends. Usually with freight, on Friday, you're having to get booked with something to move on towards that Monday. You're, you're basically looking at something to carry you over the weekend that's either going to get you home under a load or it's going to, you know, necessitate you driving you know, those two dead days is the money's got to be there. You don't want to drive around for two days, you know, to where let's say you're taking a load that's only going 800 miles, you know, and it's paying, even if it paid 1600 bucks, that's a good rate and everything. But you're essentially, since you had to pick it up Friday, you spent Saturday driving it in, Sunday driving it in and Monday, you know, Monday morning, at least you spent, that's almost three, you know, going into, you know, a fourth day of work for 1600 bucks now when you start to divide that down that's not very much a day it's 400 dollars a day gross so so but cars you kind of scoop up an extra day because you get to use saturday dealerships are open on saturday auctions are open on saturday uh with some direct direct customers if you're if you're delivering to a residence from a dealership or auction they'll let you unload on sunday they don't if they if you can get that car to them on sunday they'll gladly take it on sunday rather than monday because they're off work and it's a day early. You know, they, they want these cars. It also opens up a different time frame because now you're essentially dealing with about 7 a.m. until about 8, you know, 7, 8 p.m. and sometimes later. But that's just when places are open. Now, on a lot of used car dealerships and even new car dealerships, you can drop overnight. They've got a drop box where you throw your keys and they'll leave your check in there or you just invoice them and get paid later. It's a really big game changer as far as trying to pack in as much freight as you can in a week, when you have availability to manipulate everything you have, which puts me into another aspect of uh, with, with freight, where you put a load on your trailer, if it's not a wheeled vehicle or something that's super light, you can move around, uh, that freight is gonna be where it's at on your trailer from the time you pick it up until the time you drop it off. The only amount of room you have to work with is what's in front of it, behind it and around it, and you got the weights to play with that too which you can't even move freight everywhere you want to, because if you've got like, you know, a 8,000 pound excavator bucket on the back of your trailer, you can only move it up so far. You can only move it back so far to whereas with cars on a tray on a, on a setup like I have, which is a wedge, I move those cars anywhere I need them to be. If I need extra space, I can just, you know, back one up over the front and have the overhang on the front. If I need to line something up to drop off next, I can do that at my at my previous stop when I take it off. I've already, I'm already parked, I got the ramps out, I'm popping straps, I might as well pop four more and put a car where I want it to. It's so nice to be able to do that. The option to be able to 
basically rearrange your trailer without having to risk damaging something, moving it yourself, or, you know, coaxing a forklift driver at a company uh, to move it for you, which, you know, a lot of them won't because that's a lot, there's a big liability issue there. They're, you know, and, and time is a big thing too with the cars because it seems like, you know, rather, unless you're loading an entire trailer at an auction that I found, you get those cars on and off your trailer as fast as you can because you're doing it. You're driving the cars on, you're driving them off. Unless you're at like a Copart or IA or something and you're, you're having totaled vehicles that have to be forked on and forked off forked off uh, essentially the times in your hands on that to whereas you know with freight uh you're at the mercy of a forklift driver most of the time and especially first come first serve you could pull up to a place and there could be nine trucks ahead of you you know they've got to get dealt with before they get to you so that's something you really can't account for is uh pulling up to a situation like that 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 stuff starts to really pop time frame and not only that you know once you actually do get loaded then you got to secure the load and that could take a while depending on how intricate it is and then on top of that same thing you might have to tarp the load you know none of that is fast you know none of that takes no time that's all time all right and last but not least everybody let's get into practicality now this is where it's time to be extremely honest with yourself so going back to what we kind of touched on earlier let's Let's go over what the most abundant commodity is in your area. Go ahead and just do like a, you know, a radial search around where you're at. It doesn't even have to be on a load board. Just use Google Maps or whatever. See how many uh, manufacturer or, uh, you know, shipping warehouses or shipping yards there are around where, you know, let's just say pull a 50 or 100 mile radius. How many of them are there around where you're at? How frequent do they either distribute or need material? Because that's what you're going to be hauling. Now do the same thing in, a, in you know, in, a, in the same search. Pan out on that. How many dealerships are there around where you are? Used, new. How many auctions are there where you are? You know, think about that kind of stuff because I'll guarantee you that in most cases, especially if you live in a, you're a little bit more rural, that the cars are going to outweigh the freight. So if you have to drive 600 to 800 to 1,000 miles away from home to, in order to stay busy and be profitable, then you can expect this. Don't expect to be home very much or don't expect to stay busy and be profitable. And that's important, so I'll say it again. If you have to drive six, eight, hundred, a thousand miles away from your home in order to stay busy and profitable, then don't expect to see home very much or don't expect to stay busy and be profitable. You've got to do your homework and your research whenever you're looking into which one of these you want to get into because it's going to affect the business. It's going to determine how you need to set this up and how you are able to branch out, how quick you're able to branch out. This will rely on a lot because this is going to matter a lot more whenever you start getting burnout, which will definitely happen if you're getting into this super heavy. Um, as far as the money goes, uh, with CDL and non-CDL, it seems like the same trailer setups. You know, with non-CDLs, you're limited to what you can haul with cars. The same is about you're limited to what you can haul with freight. Uh, the money seems to be a wash pretty much on that. The CDL setups really start to change. You know, this is only talking about load board freight though. As far as the general uh, amount of money you can make, I think it might even be a little bit more on the flatbed as opposed to, you know, just a three car setup because I, that third car really helps, but it's nothing compared to like a four or five. So I think with just, you know, it, it seems to me like the money is, is about a wash, but that didn't matter to me. Me personally, I choosing to do the cars because it gets me home a lot more. It's a lot easier to find. I can get loaded and stay loaded really close to my house, which is terrific. Now I can run a much more tighter area. I'm starting to get callbacks. My business cards are getting everywhere. I'm starting to see people more than once. This is really important when you're trying to grow a transportation business. You can't just go knocking on doors and expect to have everybody's freight. But when it comes to cars though, it's a lot easier to prove yourself because you can usually get to those people very promptly, especially if you're working, like I said, you know, a tight radius to where you can pass through there a couple of times a week. But yes, you can definitely make money in both, but I would highly recommend that you look into what is the most possible around where you live. So that's it, everybody. I hope this helped. I hope this helps some people kind of see one side or the other. Uh, as similar as all this is up front, it's a very different game in the back when it comes to that trailer. So cars and freight are nothing alike, and it actually shocked me at how different the two worlds were.